thanks for the invitation. Um, as uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm Georges. I'm, I'm still a resident in plastic surgery in uh, one of the major trauma centres in London. It's called the Royal London or Barts Health Trust. And also at the same time, I'm a research student for my PhD and trying to investigate and put in in the matter all the um, questions that Elena was discussing earlier about understanding of when and uh, uh, how can we uh, optimally and efficiently train someone. Um, I'm, I'm also honored to present in front of my first teacher in microsurgery and my mentors. Uh, thank you very much. <coughs> so from the dawn of microsurgery when uh, Carol, more than a century ago, invented the uh, triangulation technique, uh, there are several milestones and uh, these things uh, actually change not just the microsurgical technique but how we actually train people to it. And as you can see in this small timeline with some of the important um, innovations that change the way we perform microsurgery such as the Ackland clamps for example or the coupler device that nowadays has been used for venous and twin anastomosis. So the uh, adapting microsurgery training is very important. I also put the very recent innovation from Professor Koshima with the new very fine instruments to perform submillimeter microsurgery. So those things are actually changing what we're doing and if we do not adapt to them, we are failing. Another consideration, uh, especially from um, the society, is uh, we're using animals. And there is, uh, since uh, 1960, Russell and Burge published a book about uh, how we can use animals in an efficient way and uh, ethical way in order to establish and uh, perform what we're trying to do with them in sciences. And the three R's established and we currently are trying to adapt microsurgery training according to these uh, principles. So trying to uh, reduce and refine and uh, try to replace sometimes the animal models and uh, perform or um, acquire same skills using other alternatives. I put this timeline here, uh, we're in a robotic uh, microsurgery course and I know the audience is uh, from various specialties but I put some examples of uh, really challenging um, innovations that happened over the last few years uh, like the microsure microscope and I do believe that even if someone is an expert in microsurgery it does need a learning curve to learn to operate using these new technologies so I do believe that training is very important for that I also put in the bottom line some of the new simulation models which actually pushing the boundaries both of the operator and for these new devices so I do think that if we challenge any of these new innovation devices with one of the most experts in doing them, it will be challenging to perform a 0.3 millimeter anastomosis. Moving on to the very beginning, how people were used to learn uh, uh, surgery and how uh, um, maybe 100 years ago and more than that introduced the apprenticeship model. We're still using that and microsurgery is very important uh, to use that because it motivates the trainees. And in my experience as a trainee, without uh, entering the OR and see my supervisors open the, um, the guts and the uh, motivation to um, go up the ladder and try to learn those skills. Trying to um, optimize the apprenticeship model, nowadays uh, public sector and healthcare are, are pushing to patients' care uh, outcomes and patient safety. So our uh, training opportunities are getting less and less. And simulation, and IMSS, what Elena was trying to explain earlier, is very important. And I think both of those, the apprenticeship model and the uh, simulation, has to uh, happen um, equally at the same time. If we see the Miller's Pyramid, we're only working on the very top blue edge. And um, if a surgeon doesn't do something, actually doesn't understand how to re-perform that or independently perform that after. Going back a bit, um, there are some uh, papers uh, more than a decade ago about uh, specific skills in microsurgery. And if we subdivide microsurgical skill into its own components, this is a small list there is various more um, analysis into a step-by-step -step skill than how you can learn it. And if we focus into what each simulation model can provide the trainee, then we're focusing and actually we're more efficient to uh, provide that training to. 
This is an example of a ladder curriculum. So you can see here, starting from the very basic models, non-living models, which is also ethically acceptable to the three Rs, moving on to some uh, courses uh, like the rat course, as you see, small animal models. And then after a person has uh, got the idea of performing microvascular anastomosis, can then move on into more complex um, integrated skills, such as raising flaps and understanding of pedicle dissection, etc. Only then he can adapt this to the real environment, which is potentially some kind of very uh, training to understand the anatomy of the perforators and how the vessels are going into the uh, free tissue that is meant to be transferred. And we believe that following something like this would then provide you with the uh, important uh, tools so you can then enter safely to the OR. Um, recently, you, I've read a paper about um, the apprenticeship solo model. And uh, we have responded to these, and we do believe that it's very important to have this, but in association with safety measures and previous training on simulation. This is a, a small part of this ladder, which is uh, recently published on PRS. Um, they described a, a very small, non-living model for end-to-end -end anastomosis for RT and vein, and they did uh, uh, show that within 17 sessions, um, someone very junior, like third year general surgery resident, can perform in the same excellence using the GRS scoring system, which is a checklist of a step by step to perform the anastomosis. <coughs> so I do think that there is a value on that, and I do believe that every surgeon should, uh, in the very early learning curve, should perform this before moving to animals. This is uh, related to our conference, and I do think that a uh, robotic potentially have a different learning curves. And even if someone is an expert, um, I believe if he has no exposure to these devices, uh, the MicroSure or the DaVinci, I am sure there will be a, a difference on his performance, especially in the beginning uh, when he starts using it. This is a paper describing the basic uh, specific skills for robotic, which they probably are slightly different than microsurgery uh, conventionally way. Moving on to uh, uh, specify uh, my presentation about microvascular surgery. So we divide the performance of the microvascular anastomosis to the journey to perform it, so the steps to do the procedure and ending up to the final outcome. When we look at this in our curriculum, we use several ways to assess this and establish and quantify this skill acquisition. You can see here several examples of what we use, and I will uh, try to uh, speak about them um, a bit more, but I don't have time to analyze. There's quite a lot of, in each one of these clouds, there is a background of a lot of uh, research happening nowadays. So adapting our curriculum with these assessment methods, subjective and objective, we are trying to establish the numbers, the parameters that a person entering at any point of this uh, we can actually give him the best of each model using the best of uh, his time. So questions like how many anastomoses have to perform before using the rat model or uh, what kind of caliber vessels you should use on the non-living tissue before you move on the rat. So these are very, very um, um, subtle in my mind and I, I do think that there is a lot of um, information that if we try to answer we will make things uh, better uh, for the trainee first and uh, for the patients at the end. So moving on into the microvascular anastomosis specific skills, we all know that if we put the vessel together, what we want as a gold standard is to work. So patency is what we're looking into. But when you perform on, a, on the rat, for example, there is blood flow. So you just simply do the Ackland test. It's a subjective test, but it does show the flow. Uh, there are clever ways to establish this, like the flow meter that Elena was discussing earlier. When we move, though, into more um, the models that don't have physiological flow, uh, there is uh, no blood flow. So we we have some uh, we have seen some papers discussing about uh, water <coughs> pumps and saline water color pumps, but they're not really efficient. And plus, we're trying to teach someone, so we need to give a constructive feedback to them. So this is a paper from Ganem uh, describing an error list. So we analyzed the errors that juniors were performing on the non-living tissue. And you can see here the, the frequency of appearance of each error. 
And if uh, an educator sees this list, it's obvious that it can correct each one of those mistakes in the beginning. So there is no need to repeat those mistakes. And I do believe that these kind of assessment methods uh, um, make the trainee <coughs> to uh, perform uh, better and faster. Another method to assess is the GRS. We have discussed this earlier. Uh, so briefly, is uh, taking a video of the assessment. And nowadays, there is discussions about a self-assessment or a trainer supervisor feedback assessment. And that doesn't have, have, have to happen live. You can do that retrospectively. So hand motion analysis. This is something which we've learned from other specialties. So uh, the economy of movement is related to competency. So when we combine, for example, we use the dexterous MD, this is an electromagnetic field, and we put some sensors on the operator. We then track the journey to perform the anastomosis, and if someone continues to perform the same task, it becomes more economical to perform the same end product. So Mal Godric um, investigated the joint, the GRS and hand motion analysis, using a, a video hand motion analysis, which is more or less two-dimensional tracking rather than a three-dimensional tracking. And you can see the graph here, both assessments uh, match as the um, arterial anastomosis experience goes up in numbers. So going back to our curriculum, so how we can adapt this, so tailoring that curriculum with numbers using those assessment methods will give us a, a more efficient way to train people. And we have a, a tested hypothesis to replace some of those models on this and push it backward to the non-living tissues and test them. Are they actually doing what we expect the trainee to learn from? So this is the first modification. We took the traditional uh, chicken thigh model, which is basically uh, more than 10 years old, used uh, for um, uh, the ischial artery and vein anastomosis. We have dissected it, and there was also a recent paper from uh, Wei Chen which described the different branches onto this. So we have dissected and identified that there is a constant perforators which go to a muscle, similar to what we have uh, in Gracilis. <coughs> um, I, I'm not aware if all of you are aware of this, so there is an inner thigh muscle where uh, plastic surgeons take and put in another area for free tissue transfer muscle. So we have uh, classified some of these steps and we created the GRS of uh, the adductor profundus free muscle flap. As you see here, so there's the same axis as what is being traditionally been used. So D and uh, violet color is the muscle we need to transfer. So a vascular plane, costum perforator uh, with uh, letter E. And the same principles of free tissue transfers are followed. And this is performed from trainees that don't even know what is free tissue transfer. So this is the perforators, the branches, and we end up with something like this, an island of uh, muscle based on uh, different calibers vessels. And Professor Koshima is with us here. And uh, as you can see, you can use the same model to do microsurgery, so a two millimeter vessel, or a one and a half millimeter vessel, or a 0 0.5 millimeter vessel. So moving on to that, we have performed this in our lab a few times. Uh, you can see the supermax surgery anastomosis on both artery and vein, and then we use some liquid latex to flush that through and uh, see that there is patency. Also, at the same time, we open each anastomosis and use the anastomosis lab index to evaluate objectively that and give feedback to the person who performed that. So we have done this few times and we came up with some information that is a constant perforator, it gives a nice plane, it doesn't challenge the trainee because it's a horizontal, it, it's something which introduces early on in the learning curve the skills of micro dissection rather than just anastomosis in vessels and also offers something to challenge more advanced trainees with submillimeter microsurgery. So 40 trainees perform this, and we have done uh, the assessments I described earlier. I will not go in much detail into that. And we, we have found that this model is uh, it's following the same principles of the traditional chicken uh, thigh training, but it actually offers something more. And you can even push it even further with uh, supermax surgery skills. This is the feedback that we receive from these people, and this is currently an ongoing trial. We haven't had all the uh, data, but I, I do believe in it. 
so going back to this uh, ladder and moving on into the more um, uh, advanced skills like dissection, you can see this paper from the uh, France team. And we, this is a, a course I'm leaving a course teaching uh, flap raising and uh, uh, specifically for the deep flap. The problem with that is a cost ineffective and we do believe that there should be a step before that. So we have tried to analyze the same using abdominal wall of a pork. So we have done our dissection, this is uh, uh, 15 dissections and they have established that it follows the same vascularity. So the, the human anatomy follows the same patterns and the calibers are actually similar to what we do in a deep flap. So this could be potentially a cheap and reproducible model before we move on to the porcine model. Um, intramuscular dissection is also similar and is a very challenging technique and most of the trainees we teach in our lab, they find that very hard. So we introduce this in this uh, ladder curriculum in order for them to be exposed early on so that they have a mindset ready for that when it comes. So in conclusion, uh, global consensus on a validated threshold uh, is important for competency-based curriculum. Uh, novel modified non-living models potentially can have a similar effect to training uh, than the living courses and they are cheaper. And perforator dissection on non-living tissues such as the chicken thigh flap or the pork belly flap. It's something which can uh, happen before we move on living animals. And further to this, I am, I'm really skeptical and I try to doubt myself if the physiological flow does offer better training than if you perform it on a non-living tissue. Thank you very much.